Good morning and welcome to the early edition of Sales TV. I am delighted to be welcoming you all back here to the Cranfield Grenville Turner Studios and, and thank you once again Cranfield for hosting us. Um, you'll see that Alex has been allowed back into the studio. Uh, he has returned all of the biros that we were <laughs> causing the issues and his exile for the last yeah. two weeks. So uh, it's thank actually you. you driving this and I'm going to be driving the tech. So yeah. what, what have we got on this week? Well, firstly, thank you so much for having me back and for accepting the biros that I stole. Uh, so it's great to be here. Um, so this week we are talking about the state of SDRs and the industry that, uh, that make up the SDR industry. And I, uh, we, we haven't done intros. It's, it, this is the first time I've been on the couch this year. Do you, do you, do you, do you realise that? Sorry, we haven't done intros. Uh, my name's Andy Huff. Uh, I'm a lecturer in sales leadership and performance, and you are? I am the bearded sales guy. Why bearded? I don't know. Yeah, fine. <laughs> but anyway, without further ado, let me, let me welcome today's guest, uh, Mr. Kevin Beals. Kevin, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Thanks, uh, thanks, Alex, and really excited to uh, to be here. Thanks for having me uh, me on. So, yeah, I'm Kevin Mills. I'm the founder and CEO of, of My Sales Coach. Um, so, we we founded My Sales Coach last year. Had a couple of uh, SaaS startups previously, and been through that journey of, of, of building and then exiting a business. Um, but really passionate about some of the challenges that exist in our industry in in sales coaching. The, the, the lack of opportunity often for sales coaching, the fact that people don't get the coaching that uh, uh, that they need. So founded my sales coach at the start of last year and yeah, really enjoying the journey for yeah the, the third and final time I have uh, I promised. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting into the uh, the insight that, uh, that you and my sales coach has created uh, for us. Well, not just for us, but for you, we're going to chat about it. Um, before, before, before we before we dive into that, though, I, I thought it was uh, so we met 22 years ago, I believe, uh, and uh, a, li a little story for you. So, um, so I met Kevin at an event. I think it was called Revolution. I was looking in my notes. Uh, one thing you don't get with. Uh, with, with a CRM system that you do get with notes in your phone that I've tracked for 22 years, is that I was cold calling Kevin 22 years ago when he was working for Sunderland FC, and I was at Experian trying to sell you a CRM system. And I just thought it was quite apt for the conversation this morning. It took me three months to, uh, to to get in touch with Kevin, or should I say, it took Kevin three months to actually take my call. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll hold my hand up. The, these are the days where obviously cold calling worked. I, you know, uh, but you know, there's a lot of things that start from cold calling. Uh, but um, I'm just amazed that you've still got the notes from uh, of those conversations 22 years ago. That was my last job, not in sales as well. So uh, yeah, that was uh, just before really uh, started my my sales career. But, uh, yeah. So, so perhaps we could we could start there. Why why did you move into sales? Um, I think you know, like like most people, probably a little bit fell into uh, um, to, to to sales as you mentioned. There, I was working at at Sunderland Football Club. I've met my Geordie Lass and uh, looking for the next opportunity uh, whilst living up in the in the in the northeast, and kind of fell into sales was an amazing uh, tech startup and uh, went through that journey, joined then another tech startup when I know we are, we, uh, we, we met uh, uh, Alex and we were both working in the same industry at, the, at, the, at that time in, uh, yeah. in digital marketing. And um, yeah, well, I, I guess, yeah, first of all, as I say, fell into it, but really then had a passion for, for what we do, growing those skills and, uh, uh, and, and, and career. Um, and then, you know, first as uh, uh, as a sales professional, and then uh, sales leader, and then as uh, you know, as a, as, a, as, a, as a founder and CEO. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant to hear. So, so the um, the state of SDR report. Um, there's some fantastic insight in there. What, why, why do this report? Because this this isn't the first year that you've done it, is it? Or 
it's yeah, it, it? It, 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 yeah, no, it kind of is. Yeah, we're we you know, just in a, just completed our sort of like first year in uh, in, in in business, and um, you know, I, I guess you know looked obviously into this kind of research before and done these kind of reports before, but uh, yeah, just before Christmas we did this uh, um, state of SDR report. We had just over a thousand, a thousand and sixty nine SDRs that uh, kindly. And confidentially shared their, uh, their their thoughts and information on the on the state of the uh, the world through their eyes, um, and yeah, that that certainly helped us come up, as you say, with some uh, some quite compelling, alarming, insightful uh, uh, data and stats. Yeah, yeah, which I think we're going to get into. I can't help but uh, we. I mean, we've had conversations before, Andy, about the the state of sales and. Um, the pressure that are on salespeople today and, and the effects that this pressure is having on them, particularly SDRs. Um, so I, you know, I'd, I'd love to kind of, you know, get, get a feel for what you found was the most alarming kind of insight that came out of these SDRs, or not as the case may be. I mean, I've read the report, so I don't want to kind of lead you down one, one path or another, but what would you say was the most alarming insight that came out of the data um i think the one that sticks out for me that is probably most concerning is that literally only one in 12 people describes themselves as being very fulfilled in their in their role um more than half describing themselves as as not being uh, uh, fulfilled um or only slightly uh, uh fulfilled so i think yeah, yeah that that was really disappointing to to see because obviously for for most people as sdrs this is their first introduction to to, to sales as a career in the uh, sales industry um so i think yeah that that yeah there, there's clearly work to do there and perhaps with some of the other data and some of the other stats it kind of starts to complete the picture of why people don't feel fulfilled. We know obviously it's a really hard job and you know we, we have in this industry perhaps the very hardest job being the entry job. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, uh, you know, we, I think the fact that literally just one in 12 described themselves as being very fulfilled in that role mm -hmm. is, uh, was really worrying. Yeah. What? I think the, the almost 50% is not fulfilled or sort of like you know just getting there. I, I'm fascinated because somebody else put a stat in front of me, not not based on a, a uh, SDRs, Kevin, but actually apprentices, sales apprentices, and um, the dropout rate. And actually, somebody had surveyed why the dropout rate, and actually, 33% had left sales. It wasn't to do with they got another job, they'd gone to a competitor, they'd, they'd yeah. left sales. And there must be some kind of overlap in in kind of the audience that you surveyed and and the audience that the data came from there? I, I'm, I'm sure. But actually, one of the questions we did ask is, do you think you'll be in sales in five years time? And deliberately, I guess, for the same reason, kind of ask that question. Is this people that are in transition, need a job, perhaps, you know, deciding what they want to do with their lives? Or is this people that are looking to build their career in, in sales and have made that conscious decision to, to start their career in, um, in sales? Um, only 10% thought they wouldn't be in sales in five years time. Um, so yeah, there, there were some that were still not sure, but only 10% said they didn't think they would be in sales in five years time. So yeah, there was definitely the suggestion that largely this is an audience that you know, are committed to building or trying to build a career in, uh, uh, in sales. Again, maybe going back to that fulfillment though, far more concerning was that around half weren't sure they would be with their current employer in just 12 months time. So yeah, definitely a, a real disconnect there that yeah, there does seem to be a commitment to being in sales and building a career in sales, but not necessarily a commitment to the organization they're with or, or, or a reason to feel that they will be in that, uh, in that role in just 12 months. There's a, there's a great uh, quote here, uh, Kevin, from a, a, a fan of yours who's delighted to see you and, uh, and, and Alex. Uh, no, it's not. It's a guy called Volker. Um, ah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, he says, the, pre yeah. the pressure on salespeople is huge. We finally, as a profession, start to talk about the challenges around the ups and downs of sales and how it impacts mental health. 
Mm. And I think obviously the audience and the things you do are, are vitally important because if we don't look after their health right now, yeah. then that 50% that leaving their employer could well be 50% who just go, I've, I'm done with the whole thing. And yeah, yeah and that, yeah, there were, again, some really alarming stuff that came out around perhaps that, you know, the, the, the challenges and, uh, um, and mental health of, you know, of SDRs, just you know, going through a, a couple here. Um, around half suffering from imposter syndrome, 46% that says, you know, they suffer from uh, um, in, in imposter syndrome. Um, burnout being the third most popular number one challenge that SDRs say that they face. So we gave SDRs literally a list of like 15 different challenges that they may face in their uh, in their role, um, yeah. targets, lack of coaching, both of those were, you know, were, were very uh, high competitors, um, not necessarily having the right tools, all of those things, data, but burnout was mm. the third most popular challenge that they felt, felt that they faced as yeah. the number one challenge, um, and yeah, so uh, you know, again, there, uh, you know, um, anxieties were, you know, were amongst the, uh, the 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 top challenges. Whether that be just anxieties about targets, anxieties about cold calling, um, you know, there, there's some real, yeah, there's mm. some real challenges that, that the SDRs are faced with. I I feel I'm somewhat biased about my view when, when I'm hearing you talk about these things, Kevin. You know, uh, I I. It does pain me uh, to, to hear about SDRs that are forced to do things that they don't believe is working, yet they're, f they're forced to do these things or, uh, you know, bonused on doing these activities day in, day out, like cold calling, like emailing, and they're not necessarily getting the response that they believe they could get unless they tried something else, but they don't have the freedom or the autonomy to try these things. So I feel like this is the cause of the burnout, it's the cause of the anxiety, it's this lack of autonomy that SDRs have, because they're essentially being treated like battery hens. Do you, do you have a view on that, Kevin? Yeah, Cause I, I think, yeah, so like, again, you're, you know, you'll be familiar with in so many teams where it is driven by metrics and activity, and perhaps without necessarily the understanding of you know, why the, you know, even why those metrics and activities uh, um, exist. I think you know, there is obviously a slight dichotomy that you know, in an ideal world, it would be great that every SDR felt like they were in charge of their own business, making their own decisions, running their mm. own experiments, um, choosing the channels that they're best suited to and they get the best results and the best returns uh, from. And in an ideal world, and in you know, in, in some uh, some organisations, maybe some of the best organisations, that's maybe what happens. I think equally though, SDRs don't necessarily get the time to be able to find what works, to find what they're great at, to mm. to not invest time in experiments that uh, that aren't successful. There is a demand that you know you ramp, you ramp quite quickly. These are the uh, the targets, these are the goals. That's what you're going to be judged on. And, and so organizations, you know, perhaps trying to be helpful, steer that with some kind of, here's how you should be spending your day, here's the activity levels that we deem as being required to be successful in this, uh, in this role. I think perhaps the disconnect is one that there isn't, you know, in some roles, any degree of freedom. It is kind of like you make this amount of calls, you send this amount of back, uh, emails, this is how you portion out your, your day. And secondly, not necessarily, as you say, an understanding of why they're doing that, of like you're, you're doing something that you just don't believe in and don't believe is going to be successful. Undoubtedly, the, the results are inevitable. You're, you're going you're gonna to prove you're going to prove that because you didn't believe in it in the first place. So yeah. making sure people understand why they're doing that and why those activities might be important yeah. um, and obviously helping them when, you know, when, when they're not working for them. Yeah. Should we bring, bring Mr. Gray on Mr. Adam or Gray, Dor I'll, Dorian? Oh, I, uh, yeah. no. <laughs> our co-host. I was, I was I've got a say, feeling you have a point of view on, on yeah. this topic. But first of all, thank you for your delightful introdu introduction at the beginning. Um, uh, no, but joke, joking aside, um, I, I thought that, that one of the most terrifying things from this report was that uh, you said only 10% of people felt fulfilled in their, in their role, uh, and yet uh, 
yeah, and, and the vast majority of people still thought that they were going to be in this kind of role in five years' time. Only 10% thought that they weren't going to be. So surely this means we've got a huge number of people that are deeply dissatisfied with what they're doing and yet are still going to be doing that in a year, in two years, five years. Um, this is this is a factory for creating poor self-esteem and mental health issues, isn't it, potentially? Now, further to Alex's point, obviously, you know, there's the big issue with the fact that you you are being treated like a battery hen. You know, you're having to go through all of these different exercises over and over and over again, where you have no belief that those exercises are going to yield the results that you need. But um, it's a shocking lack of empowerment, isn't it, where people feel that they can't get out of the situation in which they find themselves. So I, I think it, well, I totally agree with you, but I think uh, it's possibly even worse than this because I think in the current uh, the current climate and the, the the world that we're in today, a lot of people have gone into being an SDR um, on the dream, on the promise that I'll be an SDR mm -hmm. for nine months and then you know I'll be promoted to being an AE and then I'll be stepping away from this this battery hen environment as you as you describe so you know you know an environment that they're telling us that they're not 88 percent are not very fulfilled in um but they are looking for a career in sales and look at it as you know as as that stepping stone um and looking to i think you know as i say perhaps have been sold on that stepping stone being as short as possible and i think two things now are happening one we don't have as an industry the next step in their progression, perhaps at the speed that happened previously, you know, there, there was in high growth organizations, particularly in tech organizations, um, it was very easy to take people from being SDRs to being account executives, business development managers mm -hmm. in a fairly short period of time because you needed to fill those roles and you were growing those roles. Now we've all resized, become more efficient um, and those roles don't exist and those opportunities don't exist. So, you know, I think you've got a whole set of people in those SDR roles who have either realized or are about to realize that actually those stepping stones and those next steps weren't as easy as perhaps they believed or were sold on when they came into the industry. And the second is that, you know, we've almost conditioned that, yeah, you do an SDR for nine months and then that's great. You step up into this role and, you know, you don't have to spend all of your time prospecting anymore. Um, and then you know, we, we throw people into you know, what essentially is a very different role without necessarily having the core skills or the experiences to be ready to do that. And that is definitely something that you, know, you see countless times. We need to reset expectations in the industry. I, you know, I, the work that you do, Andy, around professionalizing sales, you know, is, is going to help the industry, I think, as part of that recalibration. The work that you do, Kevin, around ensuring salespeople have the right access to coaching, I think will help. But are these two things alone the solution? How well should we be thinking about this? I think it's your, your fan who's stalking you, Kevin, <laughs> put a really good point up on here, which I'll, I'll read out, which is, uh, you know, it's Volker has said, you know, don't forget, uh, with sales now being a more reputable profession, I've got to say, Volker, I'm, I'm not completely convinced that that's a, a complete statement. Not having a fight with you, but I don't think buyers think sales is a reputable profession. Mm. But what he goes on to say is that the career paths might be a bit more clear than they were 20 years ago. Mm. Um, and if you look at the states, there is a lot of trends coming from the, uh, the, where the, a lot of the sales trends are coming from. You know, people go out to uni and, and they want to go into sales. And I think that in itself would be really interesting in your viewpoint. There is a huge amount of, of um, uh, what we call undergraduate courses in the US. Now, none of them are consistent, but the good thing is there's huge amounts of undergraduate courses. Some are friends of mine, like Adam Rapp down at uh, Ohio State. Willie Bollinger over down at Texas, brilliant. But actually, what we've done is just solved the first part of the puzzle there, which is there's a qualification. Mm. What happens is these universities let these people go out, and actually, as Kevin said, they're going to possibly very high-tech organizations. You're going to do an SDR role, and there's nobody to support them. So that's mm. where 
the EPN, which Jordan leads, your son in, in, as part of the ISP, can play a huge role. That's where Kevin's design of, of, of coaching, and that's a love to have a conversation about how we industrialize that for yeah. young people. Yeah. Um, and it, it's really fascinating for me is I, just listening to Kevin talk. When I started sales, I went into an office and I was a junior AE, but I was an AE. There wasn't any different roles in our organization. We all got a patch, we all got a car, we all got go out there and sell to customers. But I knew I had to learn my craft, but it was learning my craft. I wasn't in a different role. And all of a sudden, about 15 years ago, we invented these roles to try and reduce the cost. You, mm. you mentioned efficiency, Kevin, reduce those costs and try and find the edges of the market. Inside sales was the first role. Mm. And you've got companies now that have got two, 3,000 inside sales people in, in a building in Dublin. Mm. Then we introduced SDRs and then we, and it's like, actually, the, there's, there's no, the mathematics don't work. You can't yeah. all go, as Kevin said, into an AE role because there isn't that same level of AE roles. But what we could do is give them better coaching, better care and mental health. And also what we could do is help them prepare for the next role. Mm. So this is where Idea Gen and Ben Dorks, who's been on right in season one, he actually has a concept that says, we will develop you for that AE role so you have the right to compete for it and you'll mm. get that opportunity to compete, but you're not necessarily gonna automatically get it. And I think that sets a really healthy culture. Yeah. yeah. Kevin, what, what was your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I agree uh, there as well. You know, another actually data point that came out of the survey, which, which again really took us by surprise and like shows, I think a massive untapped opportunity as, uh, as an industry. Um, four percent of people felt their next role was in customer success or customer or account management. Um, Sorry, what percentage? Four. Four. Okay. Which, again, yeah, we we know the skills that you build up as an SDR, um, coupled with actually, you know, ironically, customer success and account management is becoming increasingly. Um, focused on, on on having those sales skills and you know obviously the ability to delight and make customers happy but looking for the opportunities to um, the, the growth opportunities and the the, the, the retention elements of, uh, of those roles being critical as well mm. the fact that literally only one in 25 people thought that that was their next likely step really quite surprised us 55 percent said said aes 18 percent said SDR managers um, and the, you know, the rest was, was all very, uh, a long tail of, of very small percentages. I was surprised that it was as low as that because I know some amazing customer success managers who started as SDRs and are amazing customer success managers in part because of their experiences of, uh, of being an SDR and building those, those core sales skills. So I think, again, there's a bit of an education gap there of the opportunities that might exist. We have kind of conditioned is the conveyor belt you start as an SDR your next step is to this and I, I don't think we're helping people appreciate what the right opportunities for them personally might be mm. what was sorry so I was just saying Alan Clark an, another stalker of yours uh, Kevin um, he said it might be a bit controversial but I think anyone entering this career needs to be aware it's a tough place mm. I would say it can be tough but I think we've lost the fun I'm not completely convinced that we've actually yeah. got that. When I, I, it was tough for me when I started. I mean, I got some real big knockbacks, but it was fun. I remember those days very fondly. Yeah. What, I'm interested to know what the split, you know, in terms of diversity, you know, gender split. Did Did you look at that? Did you go? We did you, yeah. No. Yeah. We're pro probably with probably with hindsight um that was uh yeah that that was a bit of a, a gap we you know we, we did it as a you know a, um, as well obviously as a, a confidential uh, but yeah we didn't yeah. ask the ge uh, gender or, or ethnicity one of the reasons actually why it would be great actually to know that as well obviously from you know just understanding maybe some of the the, the nuances but just you know thinking about things like that like, like gender another like really disappointing thing i know this isn't gender specific but one in seven people has said they have um, had inappropriate behaviour from a prospect. Um, right. Which again, you know, like, uh, you know, are, are we aware as leaders that, you know, that we are thrusting people into an environment 
um, and are we supporting them through situations where you're unfortunately and ridiculously they're being exposed to behavior that they would consider in, in, inappropriate and uh, you know I, i'm sure you know what if we were to do a gender split of that i'm sure that that, that would be more challenging for you know for, for females uh in in sales more than males as well mm. that, that is you, you just touched on something there that, 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 that my wife talks about actually uh, and I know you, Adam and Tim, are in the social, but I just keep forgetting about it, Kevin, which is actually people, you know, my wife gets propositioned on LinkedIn and I just look at it and go, mm. sorry, why? Mm. Not that she's not attractive, beautiful and all this, but I, I can't comprehend why people would do that. Because mm. it's like Adam, who you and I were talking about the humanity. So there's lots of people who are really, really obviously brilliantly digital, but they are doing things that you wouldn't dare do in a pub. Yeah. Yeah. There is people who really know how to work um, decencies that aren't very digital, yeah. and it's somewhere in the middle of that line, isn't there, where you've got that perfectly decent person who's also perfectly digital. But I'm I'm shocked about that. I mean, yeah. I mean, it'd be great to try and find out what was classed as it, you know, that kind of behaviour, you know, because yeah. I'm sure abuse is also part of that. People just saying, you know, go forth and multiply. Yeah, yeah, in a certain ways. Yeah, and yeah, and, and yeah, I know it was mentioned by yeah, I think it, you, you mentioned Alan came in with it, yeah, that there is a, a robustness needed for a career in sales. There, you know, it, it isn't an easy uh, a career at all. But obviously, when you are talking about people crossing a yeah, the, the rejection is you know is is one thing. Obviously, that um, is an inevitable part of uh, uh, of, of, of selling. Um, but whatever anyone described yeah i think the fact that someone has described it as inappropriate shows that you know what whatever is being classed as inappropriate and um you know and i'm sure that as that that covers a multitude of uh, of, of different things is creating a you know a, an incredibly uncomfortable position for for people who are who tend to be young who are definitely new in sales and probably have a lack of support and certainly a lack of support in those kind of situations around you know that, those, those those moments yeah I, I do think though we um, we owe it to ourselves within sales to take control of um, you know take the higher ground take control of the prof you know professionalizing the approach um, and I'm going to come on to coaching here Kevin because um, you know, for, for and, and this is a quite a generalized statement, I know not everybody does this, but there is so much pressure put on SDRs, there's very little care for how the prospect or the buyer feels, they just need to get meetings, yep. or, or whatever the measure is. They need to send more emails, they need to make more calls, no matter how annoying it might be. And so, um, how important is coaching to help SDRs perform better and overcome some of this negative stress that's being put on them? Well, I, yeah, I think it is essentially critical. I think you know, most people would would readily buy into the need for coaching in order to you know to to, to grow the skills and to and, and to be success uh, successful and obviously have the you know the the, the support to uh, uh, to to do so. But again, and there were some key things that came out of the you know, the, the, the survey, 28% uh, either rarely or never coached. I mean, you know, how can you even have an SDR who feels like they are rarely or never coached? I mean, you know, the, the conclusion of that person and that person's growth and achieving their potential is so inevitable um, in, that, in that instance. Um, only 41% said that they get coaching more than than once a um, once a month, um, pro probably this is the most worrying bit. Was also about the quality of the coaching that people said mm -hmm. that they get. Eighteen percent ranked it as as, as as nine or ten out of uh, out of ten. Um, Fifty percent gave the coaching that they did receive, even though it wasn't that much. Um, zero to six out of ten. Wow. So you know, not only are they not getting coached <laughs> as a profession. Um, they're not getting quality coaching. They certainly don't perceive they're getting quality coaching. And I think this is again where 
yeah, there is there's a difference between managing and coaching, and both are obviously yeah. critically important. But that time that we do spend with people, bearing in mind they're not necessarily always in the office now, and all of those things, the time that we are spending people, are we spending it actually coaching and supporting people as well as managing them? Um, and certainly, you know, the evidence of that and the evidence that we see every day is is that they're not. Should should the manager also be the coach in one breath? I'm I'm kind of laughing. He's a great guy, not not Volker, who's just had to drop off, but uh, a guy called Volker Reese, who's I know, I know from uh, UPS, uh, and he set up an academy. Actually, Kevin, this is ten years ago, um, and new graduates and a bench of new graduates, and they weren't allowed anywhere near a manager. They were given an academy coach, and that academy coach coached them, developed mm -hmm. them in their craft, and then when a vacancy arrived, they were then placed in that team. They they moved into that team. They so therefore, to your point, and I, I don't necessarily think they should be. I think a manager should be able to coach, but I don't think you should necessarily always have the manager do coaching if you've got the budget. Have a specific coach spend money on people like Kevin getting in. Mm. Yeah. So I, I would slightly dis I would slightly disagree. So I definitely get the sentiment, and you know, obviously love love the fact that you know you're endorsing uh, organisations like my sales coach that can help support and provide that. I, you know, I don't think we would never kind of present ourselves as we are the outsource solution. You don't have to worry about coaching anymore because we come and do it. Um, it is more that I think you know, when you ask any great manager, great leader how much coaching they do and how much coaching they would like to do, those are two different things. And, you know, managers, leaders, obviously wearing so many different hats, so many different responsibilities. And critically, most of them are far more time critical than coaching. Coaching can wait till tomorrow. My board report can't wait till tomorrow. That interview that I'm doing today can't wait till tomorrow. Um, and unfortunately, inevitably, you know, it therefore goes down the, the pecking order, not because people don't see it's important, but because it's just not necessarily always as time critical. Um, so, but equally, I think there is, as you say, there's a real difference between managing and coaching. Those are two different disciplines. And it's really hard as a manager or leader to totally detach yourself from that. You know, as a manager and a leader, my team have targets they have goals i know who my top performers are i know who's struggling i know who frankly i'm 50 50 on whether they're going to be with the organization in three months time because they are going to need to improve performance in order for that to happen mm -hmm. and i can't leave all of that at the door and just be a coach you know all of those team targets those individual targets you know what i'm being tasked to do and achieve are all real and i can't detach myself from that in a, in a coaching conversation completely in a way that perhaps an independent coach or an external coach who is all about that individual, all about helping them be achieve their goals and be the best version of themselves is totally detached from mm. having that responsibility of being a manager as well. I think, and then there lies the dichotomy, right? This, this juggling act that managers, leaders have to do. Adam, any, any final thoughts as we approach the end here? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm minded of you know in in view of everything that you've said, Kevin, and and uh, the report and, and what that has thrown up as some fairly significant concerns in terms of how uh, how particularly SDRs are engaging with the world of sales. It, it it kind of makes me think of the old joke about the guy that pulls up and asks uh, a local. You know, wise down his window and says to the local, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to Main Street? And the local says, well, I wouldn't start from here if I were you. And we're talking about having to make some fairly radical shifts in terms of the role that we're asking SDRs to do, how we're developing SDRs, how we're structuring sales in order that they have a clear pro career progression in a reasonable kind of time scale, how we are making these people feel valued and fulfilled in their role. Is this are the changes we're likely to be talking about simply playing around the edges? Do we need to have a more fundamental restructuring of how SDRs and sales teams and sales functions within organisations work together? Wow. Perhaps that's uh, the question that we tackle and on another episode, have Kevin back. That's a, that's a big one. <laughs> it, it, it is massive. So 
We have to unfortunately wrap there, Kevin, but I do think we'd, we'd love to have you back to, to unpack some of this stuff as a special edition. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, use some other data points as well to, to really look at what we need to do as, a, as an industry to, to look after these first entrants. Um, yeah. Just so you know, um, I've been sitting here thinking it's been brilliant to have the Foo Fighters frontman on, on sales TV. Um, <laughs> and I'm itching to ask you when, when you're next on tour, because we will be actually putting out, we had Dave Kroll on, on sales TV. Um, sorry, it's been, but, you know, do you want to thank Kevin? And Yeah, um, Ke Kevin, thanks so much for, for giving up your time this morning. Uh, the work that you're doing at My Sales Coach, I have to say, is, is brilliant. Uh, what you're doing for the industry, K keep creating uh, that report. I think without this insight, we can't make some, you know, key decisions about how we influence the, the industry going forward. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gray. Uh, this was another episode of uh, Sales TV. Until uh, the later edition this afternoon, or next week, we'll see you next time. Take care, all. Bye.